Welcome to Think Small Cell webinar, Small Cell Analyst Forecast Spotlight. My name is David Chambers. I'm founder and senior analyst at Think Small Cell, and I'm joined today by Caroline Gabriel, head of research at Maravedis Rethink, and Joe Madden, founder and principal of Mobile Experts. And these two analysts are going to be presenting their view and their forecasts and explaining not just their methodology, their underlying assumptions, and we'll be discussing some questions, including from the audience later on. The format of today's event is that I'll first introduce a classification and categorization of the different types of small cells, because this has evolved and changed over the last year or two, and different analysts do use different interpretations of these categories. Then I'll pass the baton over to Caroline and Joe in turn to present their views, their assumptions, their forecasts. And then we'll move on to the question and answer session. You can at any time submit questions through the panel on your screen. So here are the four categories of small cells according to the Small Cell Forum. A residential small cell or a femtocell, as it used to be called, will form by far the largest volume of small cells. And these are very low cost products that provide the complete functionality of a mobile phone base station and connect in through your residential broadband internet connection. Most of those are 3G and there's a split between 3G CDMA and, and 3G UMTS technology. But those products would typically cope with uh, perhaps four or, or eight concurrent sessions or calls at the same time. And as the industry evolved and silicon became more powerful, we saw larger units being deployed in enterprise. Now, the definition of enterprise is not just an office building, but it can be any non-residential in-building application. So that includes hotels, hospitals, conference venues, coffee shops, uh, and uh, the, the traditional business. And those systems are either uh, larger, higher capacity units, 16 or even 32 um, concurrent calls, but more likely are grouped so that there's uh, sometimes a central controller for a number of small cells deployed throughout a building. And the issue today is, is mainly about voice coverage. And so it mainly these systems today use 3G. If we then move into the urban environment, we're talking about these dense urban downtown areas where the total capacity density, the total data throughput of the mobile network needs to be very high in a very small space. Small cell allows the reuse of the same spectrum many, many times and allows the network operator to achieve very high capacity densities. So these urban small cells are again, typically more powerful up to 64 or, or higher um, concurrent calls or sessions per box and are available both in 3G and 4G today. And last but not least, a rural small cell probably overall will, will again be a, a relatively small percentage of the total, but these provide total 3G or 4G mobile phone service in isolated pockets, remote areas and regions, both in developing and developed parts of the world. And they can be deployed off grid, sometimes with solar or wind power and satellite backhaul. Now, some in the industry don't include all of these categories in their definition of small cells. And they would isolate uh, femtocells or residential small cells as a, a separate type of, of product. And that means that when you talk to some operators, their view of small cells are only those ones that they would directly be involved in planning and deployment. Perhaps another way of looking at that is, is again, just to, to split between the, the planned where the RF network planning department in the mobile network operator is 
predetermining exactly where it's going to be deployed versus an unplanned unit where it simply uh, pops up on the network uh, and you can't know or predict where they, that will happen. And that's very much the case with a residential small cell where a customer that's unhappy with his mobile phone coverage indoors may go and uh, buy or acquire or be given uh, a small cell, plugs it in, and at some point it becomes uh, available on the network. And that may not even be 24 hour service. It may be switched off at night. It's totally out of control of the radio planning department. Then we move up to enterprise small cells where the, the radio planning department, the, the, the network operator operations team would be visible or aware perhaps that a small cell or a group of small cells had been deployed in a building but they're not so worried about exactly which floor or exactly where within the building they're installed. They would be involved in ensuring good handover as you enter and exit the building, and perhaps involved in some configuration there of the network to accommodate that. And then as we move up uh, both into rural and urban small cells, these are very much targeted by the network operator planning team. They'll decide where the hotspots are, exactly where they need the additional capacity and pinpoint where and when these products are to be installed. Now, if you compare that with Wi-Fi, again, residential Wi-Fi, very much ad hoc, can be deployed anywhere and everywhere. Enterprise Wi-Fi is a lot more structured, uh, a lot more predictable, but may not in involve any uh, operator or wireless uh, ISP. And then carrier Wi-Fi deployed by a network operator would tend to be very much more planned and predetermined exactly to capture traffic in these uh, hotspot areas. And we're now seeing 4G come into play with enterprise small cells being deployed in countries like South Korea, Japan in significant volume, specifically for enterprise first but more recently, we've seen the introduction of residential 4G small cells. And no doubt we'll see significant numbers of urban and even rural LTE small cells in due course. So given that these are the categories, what are the issues that we've seen with various analyst small cell forecasts in the past? And, and do they still exist? Well, certainly there's a huge contrast between residential and the, the planned small cells. It can be tens of millions of, of residential versus a few million or, or even less of, of other types of small cell. And the predictions that we've seen in the past have, have often been confident of a, a short-term uptake in the next year or two that typically hasn't come to fruition. So how confident can we be that these latest small cell forecasts aren't just another false dawn. Now there's a focus on numbers, it's typically shipments, and clearly that's what uh, component vendors would be most interested in. But uh, when you look at the wider ecosystem, you know, which sector of small cells actually has the most revenue associated with it? It doesn't necessarily follow. What impact will carrier Wi-Fi have? You know, will that completely dwarf the, the need or requirement for cellular small cells, or will these complement each other? And last but not least, can we drill down these forecasts and differ between the, di the different radio technologies of, of 3G, 4G, um, and multi-mode products that can do both? So with that uh, complex set of questions and issues, I'm gonna hand over to our first analyst, Caroline Gabriel, Head of Research at Maravedis Rethink, for her analyst forecast on small cells. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you, David. Um, welcome to everyone on the webinar today. Um, just a few comments about our methodology here at Maravedis Rethink. Um, we start with a demand-driven approach, um, which is based around the 40 top uh, mobile operator groups in the world, which covers about 180 operating companies. 
and our research and forecasts are based on direct surveys and information from as many of those companies as possible, um, combined with some very detailed modelling. Our starting point uh, is the, the data, mobile data levels uh, that they're currently experiencing and anticipated increase over a five-year period. Um, based on that, we take uh, calculations of their site numbers, their capacity needs, their likely spectrum availability, the terrain they're in, business model, and so on. Um, combine that with input from the vendors and the rest of the ecosystem um, to create the sort of forecast that you see in front of you. And we cover all aspects um, of the access network, um, macro sites and small cell sites, but of course today we're focusing on the small cells and we adjust these uh, forecasts twice yearly. Um, as you can see from uh, the graph, we've, um, we've got quite a significant increase in the installation of small cells and um, here we're focusing entirely on public access small cells. We don't forecast the residential um, products. We look at public access indoor and outdoor um, and enterprise small cells will wear those are directly deployed or controlled by the operator so that might well be something like a shopping mall. And you can see here uh, we've got you know fairly slow progress 2012 to 2014 for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about later some of the barriers to deploying public access but some significant mainstream rollouts starting um, from late this year and going up by 2018 to the total uh, deployed that year of about seven and a half million. Uh, with 2015 we see has been quite a turnaround year by the end of that year um, the market will almost be hitting the 1 million mark deployed and then 2016 is when the technology really hits the mainstream. So cumulatively over this period about 16 million of these cells deployed and that includes cells that have Wi-Fi integrated into them but doesn't include Wi-Fi only hotspots. So that's looking at a compound annual growth rate about 144 um, from 2014 to 18. So on the next slide we look at what is driving this kind of uptake and one of the interesting things about um, a really immature market is that of course um, it changes a lot, expectations change a lot and while operators level of interest um, remains very high from since we started uh, looking at this market several years ago, um, their sort of emphasis uh, and their priorities do change over time as they start to, um, to drill down on, on their business models and their deployment models. So although our overall numbers haven't changed dramatically in the last year, we are seeing different mixes, for instance, in um, the balance towards indoor versus outdoor deployment um, and some of the other priorities that operators are adopting. Um, so on that indoor-outdoor point, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, in 2014, almost 80% of public access um, cells are being deployed indoors, and that's significantly more than we anticipated a year ago, or the operators were anticipating. And that's partly because uh, there are more barriers to deploying outdoors in terms of site acquisition, backhaul, and so on. Um, but also, the business models are more apparent indoors. It's, as we know, where uh, the bulk of mobile data usage takes place. Um, and although operators have always known that, um, that's become intensified in their thinking. Thank you, Caroline. I'm sure we'll revisit many of those issues later in the webinar in our Q&A session. But now I'd like to pass the baton over to Joe Madden, founder and principal at Mobile Experts, a company that he founded in 2002. Over to you, Joe. Uh, yeah, we've been uh, we've been forecasting the small cell market for five years now, and uh, as as we've gone along, you know, we've we've noticed that uh, a lot of the forecasts around the industry have been uh, have a really wide variance. We've we've seen uh, ten or twenty times difference uh, between our forecast and some of the other numbers in the industry, and I'm very pleased to say that this year. Uh, as Caroline indicated, a lot of those trends are now coming into focus and, and we are seeing uh, numbers between uh, different uh, groups of forecasters and different uh, operators and, and various uh, suppliers. A lot of their trends are starting to converge to where we're getting the same story in multiple places. 
so that is very encouraging. In our forecasting work, uh, we do look at uh, all different kinds of small cells. Um, and uh, maybe just a, a note on uh, the nomenclature here before I go into the numbers. Uh, we've actually uh, adopted some categories which converge with the uh, small cell forum categories that David was talking about earlier. Um, one difference between uh, uh, our names and what David is talking about is that uh, when we talk about enterprise small cells, um, we're actually not we're not capturing all of the indoor units there, but just the ones that are uh, affected in some way by uh, the local enterprise. So for example, if it's a, a coffee shop that provides the backhaul, uh, or if it's a corporation that, that has some IT manager that's involved in the installation, uh, then we call that a, an enterprise uh, small cell. Uh, but if it's deployed completely by the carrier independently, and they have their own power and their own backhaul, and they're not uh, going through the local enterprise to, to actually pull off the installation, then we would call that an indoor uh, urban or an, or an indoor carrier deployment. Um, now looking at the numbers, um, what you can see is that we've been, we've been tracking residential femtocells for quite some time. Uh, we watched it grow to the range of 2 million units per year, and it's, it's actually stayed uh, relatively steady, just above 2 million units per year the last two to three years. Um, we do see that growing uh, slowly over the next five years, uh, but in talking to operators, uh, we don't see a very compelling ROI in, in the uh, use of these uh, coverage products. Uh, the operators are very much focused on capacity as their main problem in the network and their main opportunity for gathering more revenue. Uh, so the operators are focused on the, uh, the light blue and the black areas of the upper half of the chart here. Um, now looking into the, the enterprise and the, the carrier areas, uh, one of the reasons that this has come into focus and we, we, we've actually validated that a lot of our forecasts have been correct over the last year uh, is that we're now seeing uh, some of the numbers coming up. And uh, so far we've, we've had about 200,000 indoor units uh, deployed in places like Korea and Japan. Uh, so we're now getting into reasonable numbers, um, roughly half of which are enterprise units and half are deployed by the carriers themselves. And that's very encouraging because I think what that tells us is that the, the level of density that we see in these, these Asian cities um, and the level of traffic density that they have there is a, sort of a vision of the future for the rest of the world. And uh, we can take that experience that uh, we have with SKT and, and TT Docomo and KDDI, and we can extrapolate that to say uh, how we might respond in places like New York or London. As we go through uh, in the enterprise, uh, we think that there will be uh, growth in the enterprise case, uh, but it might take some time because there are some new business models that are emerging uh, for the use of enterprise small cells, uh, especially in a corporate environment uh, where there may be some integration with the local area network and, and some of the, the corporate IT functions that are going on. Uh, and, uh, and so we're actually looking for uh, larger growth in the short term from pure carrier deployments, uh, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, so, uh, as Caroline had indicated, there's, there's going to be about four or five indoor uh, small cell deployments for every outdoor deployment. And, uh, and, and we do see that happening right now. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the traffic is indoors, and by deploying small cells in an indoor environment, we can, we can have a much more efficient use of the spectrum and, uh, and more efficient coordination between the small cell layer and the macro layer. So from a technical point of view, it makes sense. And also from a business view, it makes sense to, uh, to go indoors with these small cells. Um, I guess maybe just one summary comment is that in general, you know, we look at the coverage applications with residential small cells and that'll grow on maybe a linear scale, uh, growing along with the number of people that, that use smartphones. Uh, but uh, the capacity oriented small cells will grow on more of a geometric scale along with the doubling of data demand every year. And that's why you see the upturn in the market that, that's uh, beginning now. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
just a, a few words on our methodology here. Uh, it's it's interesting to me that that we have numbers that are now starting to converge with the numbers from Caroline and other analysts around the the market, uh, because we do take a unique approach and a very different approach in how we arrive at these numbers. Um, first of all, we we have a, a process where we interview the mobile operators, and um, while we, we do look at their capital spending plans and things, the, the primary source of our data comes from the radio planning department in 32 different mobile operators around the world. Uh, so we'll be talking with those guys about how much of their traffic is on uh, a Wi-Fi network, for example, versus small cell network versus the macro network. We'll be talking about their deployment history in terms of base stations and small cells and what their plans are for how many small cells and where and how. Um, then taking those top-down inputs, we, we compare those to something that we call a bottom-up process, where we have a, a large number of semiconductor suppliers that we speak to. Um, and there's actually a number of 18 semiconductor suppliers that share quarterly shipment information with us uh, as far as uh, the, you know, the kinds of chipsets uh, and radio devices that go inside the box. And uh, we often can capture this data by frequency band, by power level, um, by inter air interface standard, so that we can keep a, a, a pretty accurate reading of what's really happening in the field. And not just uh, looking backward, but we can also look at the backlog of, of the kind of order stream that's coming into these semiconductor shops and, and see about nine months to 12 months into the future uh, what they're expected to ship into the future. Uh, so we compare the top down to the bottom up inputs and then and then uh, one thing we do as a sanity check is is to look at the cost modeling in terms of total cost of ownership models uh, and we compare those with our friends uh, in the mobile operator community uh, just comparing the dollars per bit to, to uh, handle data over different modes um, the the cost per bit to uh, pass data through Wi-Fi, for example, is far cheaper uh, than license band communications and uh, other um, other uh, modes such as small cells and macro networks have uh, uh, highly variable cost per bit depending on uh, the kind of backhaul that you have set up or the air interface that you're using, the spectrum that you're using, and so on. And so each of these operators has given us a lot of input with regard to how they plan to deploy their network, and it, it, uh, we rationalize that with uh, how much uh, money they plan to spend and, and how much data they can pass for that cost. Uh, the end total of that of that process gives us a view of how the data will be presented to the world, um, how much of it will come through the macro network, for example, and how much will, will be going over Wi-Fi networks or small cells. And what we find is that the macro network can only handle about 30 to 40 percent of the total data traffic expected in 2018. Um, another 50 percent or more of that data uh, will be going over Wi-Fi networks, whether it's in a private situation in a home or office or over some kind of a carrier uh, supported Wi-Fi network. And uh, the balance uh, will be over small cells. Uh, so at this point in time, we're expecting that about 20% of the, the total deployment, the total traffic uh, coming through mobile devices will be over small cells. So I think that's, uh, that's probably enough for now. We can leave more time for the Q&A and, and David, move, let's move on. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. Uh, just before we go on to the uh, the audience, Paul, uh, I've had a couple of questions from the audience, uh, just asking for clarification. I think that's that's perhaps more for Caroline. But um, did your uh, public access numbers include um, just 3G only, or or were they all technologies 2G, 3G, and 4G? And secondly, have you included any DAS? In, in these estimates? Um, yeah, 3G and 4G uh, in the slides I showed today are put in together, so it was solely there entirely. We, we do break it down by technology um, within our reports and so on. Um, we haven't included DAS. We do DAS forecasts, but we actually include those in, our, in the macro layer um, element um, for historic reasons um, of our forecast, so they're not included in this particular one. And lastly, the, the Wi-Fi numbers you had uh, they were just for public access only, were they? Yes, they are for public access um, where it's carrier controlled. So they don't include private Wi-Fi or indeed private enterprise Wi-Fi. They're, they're where a carrier's got it um, directly connected to the network. Um, and Joe, uh, 
do you have any do you want to make any clarifications of, of your numbers for those questions yeah let me make a comment uh, about DAS I uh, we, we actually do track DAS and we publish a, a market study every year on, on the DAS market what we found is that uh, a, a good portion of DAS uh, traffic is is going into the macro category right now uh, but over time we expect that many small cells will be deployed in concert with a DAS system. Uh, the, the small cell may either use the DAS as a backhaul or the small cell could be a signal source for a DAS distributed antenna. Uh, so uh, in our model uh, we, we talk about the data traffic that goes through small cells or through the macro network. In fact we have a portion of each of those categories which uh, uh, works together with a DAS system and uh, you know that is growing over time for both small cells and macro. Thanks very much, Joe. So um, given what you've heard from these two uh, analysts, I'm now just pushing out a poll, which you should be able to see in front of you now. Um, and we're really asking to see whether you agree with them or not. Do you think the analysts' uh, forecasts that you've heard are too high, too optimistic, uh, about right, or too low, too pessimistic? Um, or it may be that you feel there's just too many variables and uncertainties that nobody can predict these things. Um, and the last option is is perhaps you're, you're new to this space and you just don't know. So we're seeing the figures come in now and you should be able to see the results uh, on the screen now. So that was 22% um, thought they were too optimistic. 31%, which is the largest number, thought they were about right. So that's a good validation. And um, good to hear that uh, not many people thought you were you were too pessimistic um, and too low. Still a number of people either uh, uncertain or, or, or unsure, which is um, not unreasonable in, at this uh, stage of the, the game. So, uh, what we'll do now is just move on to a, a Q&A session. Um, feel free to submit some questions through the uh, through the system. Um, in the meantime, uh, I have one that came in earlier asking about uh, TDD mode, or specifically TDLTE. Uh, and given what we've seen in China uh, recently, how significant a piece of the overall pie uh, could this technology become and what are the implications for the rest of the, the small cell sector? Um, Caroline, do you have any views on that? Yeah, we do model TDD separately and uh, I think it's going to be an extremely important technology. We, we see um, a far greater weighting towards TDD in the new um, architectures, whether that's small cells or cloud RAN, unsurprisingly, uh, than, than in traditional style um, RAN rollouts. Um, that's partly, of course, China, although the, the percentage of um, influence of China does go down over time. But we see the, um, among the LTE public access cells, we see about 30% of them being in TDD mode um, in 2014, largely because of China. Um, but by 2018, about 45%, and that's not all China at that point. That's um, because we do see a lot of the TDD bands coming into play as extra capacity bands. Often they're high frequency, so they're well suited to small cells. Um, so really getting this sort of capacity layer going in the unpaired spectrum as a complement to a previous FDD rollout. And we do think that's going to be an important strategy for carriers uh, by the end of this decade, hence quite, you know, um, by that stage, new t a new small cell rollouts we think are edging up to 50% in TDD. Thanks. Uh, Joe, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I, I think there's really two ways to answer the question of how how much impact TDLT will have on the small cell market. And you know, first is the business view. Uh, what we've noticed is that uh, people tend to, uh, when they get spectrum available for some kind of LTE service, first thing they want to do is to deploy their macro network uh, because that is absolutely the the lowest cost way to get coverage, to get a service started, and to offer something basic to the public. Uh, and so. Uh, you know, we've seen that in the FDD world and, and uh, many of those FDD systems are now deployed and reaching a point where capacity is needed and they're going into that second phase of, of thinking about small cells to add capacity. Um, so from the business point of view, I think TDLTE is a little bit behind the FDD 
uh, track uh, because the, uh, the the initial macro deployment is beginning now, uh, and uh, so we'll see uh, the major uh, capital flow going into the macro network for the near term, uh, and that'll that'll be true with China Mobile and also with Sprint and in a few of the other uh, large TDLTE carriers for now. Um, over over the long term, we expect that uh, you know the both the macro networks and the small cell networks will be about 40% TDD and 60% FDD, um, just sort of in line with the amount of spectrum that's out there and and the amount of uh, uh, operators that are licensing spectrum and planning mobile networks along those lines. Uh, but I think in the in the near term, FDD will will be more dominant in in this year, and uh, we may be see some. Big bubbles of business come in as, as China Mobile moves from macro deployment to small cell deployment. Uh, it may change very rapidly um, as, as some of those uh, big one-time decisions are made. Thanks, Joe. Um, so another question is is around how um, quickly and what proportion. It, so rather than uh, numbers of small cells, it's the proportion of the RAN capex spend will will shift across to small cells um, and and how will that uh, play out over the next few years again could I could I ask Caroline to comment on that sure I mean this is obviously a complicated one um, but just to, which we could probably talk about all day but just to give some real um, slightly oversimplified uh, forecast from what we're, we're seeing um, about we think about a third of the capex that will go on public small cells from, the, um, from carriers is going to be in effect stolen from macro spending um, and the other two thirds is additional spending. It doesn't mean that the carriers are increasing their overall budgets by that much because there'll be price squeezes on both types of technology and uh, macro spending certainly on the base station side will go down quite dramatically over the period um, as macro deployments get finished off and particularly as um, they, the spending sort of shifts from the cell site to things like the servers as we go to cloud run, et cetera. So there's a lot of decline in macro spending, but we think only um, maybe 5 billion of that or so is going directly to small cells. The rest of small cell spending is actually um, additional and new. Um, and just before I, I pass back to, to Joe, you know, some, some of the other questions we've got coming in are, are, are around you know where, are, where where within that budget are the operators spending most of the money is it is it the actual equipment itself is it the the backhaul is it the the installation and site acquisition is is there a you know particular part of the total cost of op operation that um, you might want to highlight yeah i mean for, for us at, at the, in these early stages um the the capex the boxes are still relatively expensive, but the capex on those on those boxes will you know will crash. I think so. They'll be, it will become almost trivial um, in a couple of years' time compared to the other costs. So I think in the early stages, uh, a lot of the other costs are coming from backhaul and sites. And as uh, the technology develops and operators um, particularly start to outsource a lot of that effort, um, then I think it's going to be more. Um, Pardon me. Uh, more going on managed services or surrounding services to support these networks as they get far more complicated, um, and uh, so lots of that going to integrators, small cell as a service people, all, all those uh, the kind of people who will take the pain away from you as you roll out the networks. But no, this is this is really an operating cost um, for the for the carriers. I think the capex element of it will uh, disappear fairly quickly as, as anything um, you know worrying for them. Thanks, uh, Caroline. Can I hand over to, to Joe uh, to answer effectively both of those questions? Of course. Well, I mean, one thing to uh, to realize is that uh, the CapEx budgets have been shifting for many years already. It used to be very simple to talk about the capital spending for a base station because it was a, a, a number that was dominated by the cost of the hardware. Uh, but but as time has gone by now, uh, we've reached a point where the hardware has become, well, let's say, you know, this is somewhere in the range of half the cost. 
um, very difficult to define that number, and you, you can't put any precision on an estimate of, say, 50% of the cost on hardware, uh, because uh, the hardware and the software are so much intermixed, and they're not they're not sold as separate items. And so we're in that environment now, and, and uh, as we see small cells come in uh, to the picture, uh, I think it, it absolutely will be taking some CapEx away from the macro network. Uh, but uh, what you have to realize is that uh, as you take uh, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the capital spending from macros and start to devote that to small cells, uh, there's still a, a big portion of the capital spending that's devoted to software and services which are sort of common and, uh, and, and might even be shared between small cells and the macro network. So I, I think it's, uh, it's becoming a very difficult thing to track capital spending and, and to try to translate that into uh, what does it mean for uh, for any kind of hardware shipments. Okay, that's uh, that's very helpful. Um, and then perhaps sticking with you uh, this time, Joe, for, for the next question, we've had a number of uh, the audience ask about multi-operator small cells. Um, sometimes people call this neutral host. Do you, you know, how do you factor in um, either how quickly such things might exist, that is a, a small cell that could simultaneously support um, service from you know, multiple, ne multiple network operators. Um, how quickly do you think that would, would happen and, and what are the, the, the issues in, in trying to predict um, take up? Okay. Yeah, I think it's actually quite unlikely for uh, anyone to develop a multi-operator small cell as a single box. Um, you know, th technically it may be possible to do that with, with multiple chips and, and running different things, but uh, very difficult to sell such an item. Uh, what, I, what I think is more likely is for someone like a, a, a DAS neutral host to take on that role of, of pulling together uh, small cells from various different operators and putting them together into a common uh, shared infrastructure. Uh, so as separate boxes, I think it's a much more likely and even more cost-effective way to go. Uh, so, so you don't see something like um, uh, mocking, and I've forgotten the exact technology uh, term here, where, where it's possible for, for effectively one small cell with one transmitter, one frequency to uh, virtually appear as though it's it's several different networks and uh, and allow a phone to to camp onto that. Um, That's right. I, I think there like are national... technical challenges with that. Uh, there are technical challenges in the in the handsets that are that are uh, you know used mm. for different operators working on on one frequency band, for example. Uh, and there are business challenges with getting all the operators to sign into some kind of agreement like that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Caroline, do do you have any? comments on that and, and whether yeah. that you know that's yeah, pretty a... much with Joe on that one um, I, I think it's one of those issues and there are quite a lot of them in small cells where it's technically possible and um, but I think everyone struggles to see why you would go down a route that involves a lot of operator politics a lot of complexity where there are a lot of companies gearing themselves up um, whether they're from DAS environment or, or um, other as a service environment suit could uh, produce a neutral host system without having to go to the sort of cost and risk of uh, adopting this this brand new box architecture. So, I think it's not that it can't be done, but no one quite sees a compelling need to do it yet. Right. Thanks. Um, so another question coming in uh, relates to to the carrier Wi-Fi and specifically uh, Hotspot 2.0. Uh, you know, what what is the impact of of that? How quickly do you see that technology? being deployed and uh, offsetting or, or relating to the take up of cellular, licensed cellular spectrum. Um, and perhaps if I could stick with Caroline for that uh, question initially. Yeah, I must say this has been one of the areas where um, as, as far as uh, our conversations with carriers and so on, things have, have changed the most um, sharply over the last few years is the increasing confidence in carrier Wi-Fi for more than just offload, um, really integrating into the uh, into the market, into the network. I'm sorry, and I think um, Hotspot 2 and Next Generation Hotspot are, um, you know, they're very important first steps. They don't solve all the problems, but uh, I think they've really gone um, quite a long way to showing carriers what they could do with Wi-Fi. I, I think there are a lot of um, it gives them a temporary 
reprieve, I suppose, from the constant hunt for more license spectrum. Uh, I do think there are still a lot of questions over the business model, and particularly, will it be the carrier that controls the choice of uh, network, the access network that you're on, um, or will consumers demand that for themselves? So I think there are lots of those sort of business and usage issues that are arising as to how far carriers will be able to control um, these uh, these systems once they leak out into unlicensed spectrum. But um, in terms of the technology and the ease of use and the integration, um, Hotspot 2, I think, is, is vastly important as a first step. And I think it's made carriers far more committed to including Wi-Fi in their small cell strategies than they were even two years ago. Uh, thanks very much, Caroline. Uh, Joe, any comments on that? Yes, uh, I, you know I think Hotspot 2.0 is is really a very important step. It's uh, you know a few years ago we were talking about Wi-Fi and in, in smartphones and and how there were battery issues and authentication issues and that's why a lot of people were actually turning off the Wi-Fi in their handsets, uh, not to be bothered with all these pop-ups saying you know would you like to log into this uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, so I, I think the Hotspot 2.0 initiative essentially puts that issue to rest and. Uh, and meanwhile, on the technical side, some of the battery issues uh, seem to be uh, uh, less important than they were before. So, so we're now over the, the biggest hurdles toward uh, people really making wider use of Wi-Fi in their, in their mobile devices. Uh, the next step, I think, is, as, as Caroline suggested, it's, it's on the business model side. Uh, the operators uh, are really looking forward to being able to uh, make strata of different kind of data for their different kinds of customers. Uh, so you might have platinum users that are that are on some high value application like a navigation application that always gets steered to the cellular service or the highest quality of service if, if cellular is usually in that category. Um, and, uh, and then you might have people watching YouTube videos uh, being more directed toward the Wi-Fi uh, service and, uh, and, and as I say, giving a different strata of, of quality of service for different prices. And uh, I think over time, you know, it may take many years, five to ten years, but I think we'll get to a point where uh, people understand that there is a, a, a lower level of monetization for Wi-Fi, but there is a cost associated with that. Uh, and then there's a higher level of monetization and a higher cost per bit that goes along with cellular. And I think uh, both the consumers and the operators will come to a comfortable place there. Thanks very much, Joe. Okay, a slightly um, d different question now from, from one uh, viewer. Can you refer to the differences between unified small cell installed at the endpoint and a split BBU, that's a baseband um, unit, remote radio heads like uh, Ericsson's uh, Radio Dot product or Huawei's lamp site. Um, so I think it, I think that's uh, just clarifying where those fit in with your projections and I guess also any, any views on the likely impact of those uh, products. Could I ask uh, Caroline first on that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, we completely separate um, those two those types of equipment. I think it's one of the problems actually with the industry as a whole and a lot of the forecasts that go out is um, that the these different architectures often become confused whether through sometimes uh, by accident and, and sometimes I think by design. But um, for us there's a fairly clear distinction between um, an all-in-one base station that's extremely small, self-contained um, and sits at the site and any form of distributed RAN, and in that um, we'd include, you know, the, the very common architectures we have now of remote radio heads um, separated from the baseband, going towards the full cloud RAN. We have many, many um, remote radio heads um, or uh, or DAS type antennas um, connected back to all the to um, baseband virtualized on the server. I mean, I think you know, and all points in between. Um, I think they're fairly distinct from small cells, although. As Joe referred to earlier um, vis-a-vis DAS, I think small cells will increasingly be integrated into those architectures so they will interwork together rather than being set completely separate layers. But that's that's a way off. There are some technology advances needed for that. Um, so something like Radio Dot um, is is an interesting um, I mean, referred to but it's described in all kinds of ways, but um, it's not a small cell. I mean, I think however you describe it, um, it isn't a small cell. It doesn't have autonomy. It's um, 
really a very small, low power, I mean, could call it a, a kind of mini DAO. Um, I think it's it's quite an interesting approach, but um, putting it into a small cell category is misleading. Thanks. I think that's quite a clear uh, position. Joe, what's your view on, on these um, radio dots and, and lamp sites? Okay. You know, these products, uh, they are different than small cells, and I absolutely don't count them in my uh, small cell forecast. Uh, but I, I do have a forecast for these, uh, what I call miniature remote radio heads or, or uh, indoor remote radio heads. Uh, and it, it, it grows to the range of uh, 1 to 2 million units per year in the same 2018 time frame. Uh, I do think there's an opportunity here um, for the, the big OEMs because uh, the advantage that they have is that they have uh, a footprint of macro base stations already out in the field. And by deploying a, a system like a radio dot or a lamp site, they can, they can offer uh, either indoor or outdoor low power radio heads uh, that run exactly the same baseband software and in fact can be uh, integrated with a cloud RAN architecture to, to have pooled baseband resources uh, between the macro base station and the, uh, you know, the small base station itself. And that is an advantage in terms of, uh, you know, getting additional capacity density and, and a few other things. Um, in the end, I think it'll be more expensive than, than a lot of the other small cell alternatives that are out there. Uh, so I don't think it'll be uh, as much growth in this area as, as what we've shown in our small cell forecast, uh, but there is, uh, there is some growth there. Uh, one point of disagreement with Caroline, I think if, if people refer to these systems as a mini DAS, uh, I think that would be um, probably the wrong way to think about it because uh, in my mind, a, a DAS system is by definition a multi-operator system. And uh, these uh, radio dot or lamp site products are like a remote radio head. So they're, they're still a single operator or a single tenant solution. And uh, I, I think it's important to, to keep that in mind that a, a DAS is, is always a multi-operator solution. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, well, I think that just about um, brings us towards the, the end of our webinar. Um, I appreciate we, we have uh, more questions that we have time available to uh, answer them. But um, I think it would be quite useful just before we uh, close, just to ask uh, each of our analysts for some closing comments. Um, one, uh, one point that has uh, perhaps not been clarified yet is just that the, the forecasts that you've made and the, the context that you're you're talking about is is global it's not for a specific region um, so with that in mind um, Caroline do you have uh, any final thoughts yes I think just um, summing up and thinking about what we've discussed um, I think without making any sort of grand uh, statements I think this probably is the year when we'll see uh, small cells um, being deployed in reasonable numbers for public access and at that point um, operators and the whole ecosystem will be able to sort of test what works and what doesn't for real. Um, I think it, it's very noticeable seeing the operators concerns shifting from the purely technical to the business model and looking for more than just raw capacity of a sense that um, these cells need to be harnessed. Um, which will mean, going back to something Joe said earlier, but um, a lot of increased investment, which is not directly to do with small cells, but in um, intelligence tools um, to, to make uh, personalization tools. These kind of systems that really will attract a lot of the operator's money so that um, they can use these small cells to deliver added value and generate additional revenue rather than just trying to keep up with the increase in, in data demand. So I think that's an important point, that small cells may be relatively low cost themselves, but they generate quite a lot of spending on other things. On the more negative side, I think uh, there are still quite significant barriers to really mass deployment. And those barriers have changed somewhat. There's a, there's a sort of confidence that certain things like backhaul are being addressed a lot more uh, aggressively than, than they were at the start of this journey. But um, the, I think the the big one for me is um, SOM and any form of automation without which mass scale small cell doesn't really make sense. 
um, we still see a lot of concern and worry that um, the SON technologies, although they're developing, are not uh, yet something that you would bet your business on. So if I had to give one kind of closing message to the industry, it's um, that SON and, and some of the LTE advanced standards need to be implemented and tested uh, you know, to the limit before operators will, will make a big move. But it'll come, and I think 2016 is going to be the real turning point year. Thanks very much, Caroline. I think that's uh, a very measured and clear closing message. Uh, Joe. Okay. Well, from my point of view, I'm, I'm very encouraged this year to see the massive deployment in Asia, and, and that gives us a lot of more confidence that we know we can deploy small cells, and, and despite some of the barriers and the costs that go along with that, it, it can be a profitable deployment when you have a certain level of traffic density. And with the rest of the world catching up in terms of traffic density and, and reaching the level that we have in Seoul or Tokyo, uh, I think we, we will absolutely see these small cells growing. Uh, the, the remaining question for me is, you know, what is that growth rate in the small cell market? We, we have these up and to the right charts, and, uh, you know, the, the hardest part is, is to see five years ahead and just what really is the year-over-year uh, the -year growth rate at that point in time. You know, I think that's going to depend on, on uh, the governments of many different countries and how quickly they release spectrum. Uh, if there's a lot more spectrum available, then I think we'll see more macro deployment. And if, uh, if governments continue along the track they've been on for the last 30 years and, you know, sort of releasing spectrum one chunk at a time in rather slow fashion, then I, I would say that small cells will grow fairly quickly, as we've shown in our charts. So uh, that's, I think if the uh, listeners are looking for one metric to watch and, you know, just how quickly will the small cell market grow, I think watching the, uh, the licensing of new spectrum might be one thing to look at. Yeah, that'd be interesting if the if the cost of spectrum actually goes down because uh, people um, aren't, aren't requiring it quite quite so much. Well, thank you, thank you both uh, very much. Um, a couple of quick uh, pointers. There's uh, more information all about small cells on our website, thinksmallcell.com. Uh, we have a free monthly newsletter that's uh, very popular, and uh, recommend you sign up for that on the site. And we have further webinars coming up. I'll just be talking about the next one in a minute. There's also plenty of um, small cell forum documents available for free download from their website, scf.io. Um, and last but not least, if you wanted to contact any of today's analysts, um, the websites are listed on your screen now. And one last thing is our next webinar, which is two weeks tomorrow at the same time. And I'll be joined by uh, two speakers from IP Access, and Nick Johnson, the founder of the company and CTO, and Simon Brown, the CEO, who will be talking about how small cells are going to volume, um, very much complementing uh, what you've heard today in terms of the uh, forecast. So you're able to um, register for that event uh, now and we'll send a link out to you uh, as a follow-up uh, email from from this webinar so with that uh, we'll close and my thanks to the the panelists and thanks to everybody who participated and for your time to attend <laughs>